<laughs> what about now? <laughs> Two seconds after you ask the question. Um, honestly, I, um, I mean, I have an exam in here and an exam in CAD. The, my CAD exam is next week, and it's probably just going to be a spring break thing. Just come back and just you know, knock it all out. Because, like, the way I see it, um, well, I mean, let me ask. I mean, if I had to guess, the class as a whole probably thought that was easier than the first one. Real okay, we had uh, okay. All right, um, I I think the class average will be higher. I do. Um, uh, I mean, maybe I'm surprised, but um, there were a couple things I tried to do to um, make the exam smooth. Uh, like, for example, all the members were channels. You know what I mean? Like all the steel was the same grade. You know, so it required less lookups. So. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Okay, um, still a little uh, uh, behind on homework grading, but my TA is also in Capstone, so you know I'm sure that those of you that are in Capstone now sort of get it. <laughs> you know, like we'll, we'll get to it. <laughs> um, but um, this uh, this is beginning a um, uh, a new module in the class, and I would say that starting now the class really does start to take on a little bit of a different flavor. Um, I would say that the first sort of half of steel design, that the key word is fracture, right? I mean, whether we're talking about bolts or welds or tension members, that's sort of like the ultimate limit, right? It's fracture. Whereas columns and beams, the word is buckling. It's a, it's a different world, okay? And so what we're gonna do over the next little bit is talk about buckling of columns, buckling of beams. That's the rest of the semester. Um, in order to explain buckling, um, I need to talk a little bit about some of the theory. Okay. So um, first off, did everybody get the code? Okay. So today uh, will be a little bit like story time. Okay. Um, but we're so we're going to do the theory of buckling. Now, what I'll tell you is that if you had engineering two sixteen. You probably should have seen some of this near the end of the semester, but I do understand that it's probably been a while since you had that class. So uh, maybe today's a refresher, maybe it's new. Um, but it's based on a lot of basic stuff. Now, warning. Calculus is approaching, okay? We are going to see some calculus. We are going to see some differential equations. I'm not going to make you do this calculus. I'm not going to make you do the differential equations. This is just as a means of explaining what's going on, okay? So... I'm, I, I want to be crystal clear. You are not going to have to regurgitate what's on the screen, okay, when it comes to the calculus. Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. So what I want to talk about is the theory of elastic buckling, okay? And so what I mean by that is I have a column, okay? Now, a column is going to behave differently than a member in tension. So first off, the difference between a tension member and a compression member or a tension member and a column is the direction of the load. Both loads are applied along the axis. It's just a tension member yanks on the, mem on the, on the member, and a compression member, the load pushes, or pushes in. Now, what makes compression members different is that I could probably yank on this all day long, and I'm probably not going to rip it in half. But if I take this element and I load it in compression, it's going to buckle, right? Okay. And so what is buckling? It's sort of a sudden loss in stiffness, okay? Because I'm, I'm, I'm resisting the load, I'm resisting the load, and then boom, it goes, okay? Buckling is characterized by a sudden loss in stiffness and a sudden displacement, okay? Typic and, and I say typically, but it's pretty much always under compressive stress. Whether it's a column or a beam or even an element in shear, I mean, we could talk about more circle if you wanted, but um, there's always some degree of compression that, uh, that leads towards a, a buckling phenomenon. Okay? So in order to explain buckling, uh, and, and what I'm doing right now for this derivation is looking at elastic behavior. So I'm treating the column like a rubber band. Okay? So it buckles. It goes back to its original shape. We're going to break apart that a little bit later and ask, well, what happens if we have a column that buckles inelastically? We, we'll talk about that later. Okay? Um, but for elastic buckling, we're going to keep the derivation pretty basic. Okay? So we're going to consider a column that is simply supported. Okay? 
Um, simply supported just mean, you know, remember we just have a, a hinge and roller boundary condition and we're going to apply a compressive load. Now I'm applying the, I'm, I'm facing the column vertically. There's nothing to say I couldn't face the column like this. I mean, I could have the column like this with a hinge and a roller and I have the load like this, in which case the column would sort of buckle like that, right? So if we wanted to put some axes on this, this is the y-axis and that's the x-axis, but it's the same idea, okay? Um, now I propose that the, you know, we have the left and right um, uh, uh, schematics. The left is unbuckled, the right is buckled, okay? And what I wanna know is when that happens. Specifically, what is the load P that causes that to happen? What, what load P makes buckling uh, an effect, okay? Um, now, um, I, I'll say one thing about this, and then I'll move on, is that this is what the buckled column looks like. Um, this curve, I'm assuming, is sinusoidal. In other words, it's a trig function, okay? You're gonna see why here in a little bit, but if you're wondering what shape that is, we're gonna say it's trigonometric, or sinusoidal, okay? And you'll, you'll see why here in a second. Okay, everybody good? Now, I tend to think that uh, the secret weapon of structural engineering is a samurai sword or a lightsaber, if you happen to be a sci-fi fan, right? So we're going to samurai sword or lightsaber through the, uh, the section. In other words, what I'm doing is I'm cutting a section like at some random point and I'm cutting a section and I'm saying, okay, let's only focus on everything to the left of that section cut, okay? So let's just look right here, okay? So what do I have? Well, inside the, uh, inside the, the whatchamacallit right here, here, let's, let's sort of draw this down because this is actually what, the, what we're cutting a section through is this. This is just what the column looked like before. So we're cutting a section right here, okay? I'm going to have, if I have an axial load to the left, I'm gonna have an axial load to the right, okay? But there's also going to be a bending moment inside the column. Okay, and so that's basically what I have here. I just had it drawn, you know, left and right as opposed to up and down. Okay, and the question is, what is that moment? Okay, what is the moment inside the column? Okay, and I propose that the moment inside the column is really just the axial load times this distance. And that distance is just however much it's deflected, just the, the, the deflection. Okay, so I can have that the moment equals p times y, or negative p times y just because of the sign convention, because both of those moments are acting essentially in the same direction, okay? Now, um, okay, actually, yeah, I have this drawn backwards. That should be like that. Okay, so um, what do I do with that, okay? Well, what I do with that is this up here. Now, for those of you in structure, or had me for structural analysis last semester, you remember seeing that? That the second derivative of deflection is m over ei. For a crash course, remember that Y is the deflected shape of the beam, right? So if I have an element and I bend it, right, Y, Y of X is the shape of that deflection, okay? And I can relate the shape of the deflection to the bending inside the beam by saying that the second derivative of that deflection equals the moment divided by the beam's stiffness. It's Young's modulus times its moment of inertia. It's E times I, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do for this differential equation is I'm gonna say, you know what? Let's use that, okay? And instead of the second derivative of deflection is M over EI, I'm gonna take the second derivative of deflection equals this over EI. And where am I getting this? I'm getting it from that, okay? So rewrite it a little bit. Y'all remember that in calculus land, whenever we have a second derivative, we just call it Y double prime, right? So I have y double prime is this, okay? Everybody with me so far? And what I'm gonna do for math's sake is I'm going to take this term uh, P over EI and I'm gonna call it alpha squared, okay? And I'm, the only reason I'm doing that is to make the differential equation a bit easier to solve. And speaking of, I'm going to have this differential equation. Okay, this is the differential equation that I'm going to have to solve, right? Now, 
This is the solution, okay? Y'all remember how to solve these, right? And, and I know that engineering students, what you like to do is you like to go here and you say, okay, y double prime plus alpha squared y zero. And by golly gosh, g, there's your solution right there. C1 times the cosine plus C2 times the sine, right? Because that's how engineering students solve differential equations, right? I've never seen that software in my life. I do not believe that. That I definitely don't believe. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, all right. So just so you're aware, the reason why I'm calling this P over EI alpha squared is because the solution has an alpha in it. So I was just, I was wanting to avoid square roots in the final answer. Okay. Is everybody with me on that? But to be clear, alpha is just the square root of P over EI. Okay, that, that's really all alpha is. Okay. So, is everybody with me so far? Everybody with me so far? Now, let's, let's test out the, the memory of Math 335. So, whenever you solve a differential equation uh, like this, you're left with constants like C1 and C2, which are essentially constants of integration that just uh, are the result of the solution of the differential equation. Um, how do we actually come up with defined values for C1 and C2? Anybody remember? There's a term I'm looking for. The term is boundary conditions. Do you all remember that? Anybody's looking at me like, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. We've had a long we're tired, Dr. Mike. No, okay, so it, it's sort of like whenever you do an integral, right? When you have an indefinite integral, you integrate 2x, you get x squared plus c, right? You get an unknown constant of integration because there's theoretically an infinite number of solutions to that integral. The only way you get a definite solution is to bound that solution, right? So it's sort of the same thing with the differential equation. Now, in differential equation land, we tend to have two different terms for these. Um, the way I always separated them is we had initial conditions and we have boundary conditions. Initial conditions are with respect to time, right? So if you had like uh, the distance at time equals zero or the velocity at time equals zero or the acceleration at time equals zero, that initial conditions were with respect to time. And boundary conditions are sort of with respect to space or with respect to, to distance or, you know, a, a, a physical distance and what have you. Okay. Now, I propose for a column what makes sense are boundary conditions, not uh, initial conditions, or at least this column, because we're not talking about the column vibrating or anything. Now, I have two constants of integration. Okay. I have a, a C1 times a cosine plus C2 times a sine. And by the way, this is why the deflected shape is sinusoidal, right? Okay, because the solution of our differential equation had sines and cosines. Remember when you have a, a, a linear differential equation, you set up your characteristic, and if you get real roots, you get exponentials. If you get imaginary roots, you get sine and cosine pairs. That's what happened here. Um, okay, so I need to determine these boundary conditions in order to be able to solve for C1 and C2. And what these boundary conditions have to represent is if here's my buckled column, here's the column, I need to know a deflection, okay? And I propose that for this column, I know two deflections. Specifically, I know what the deflection is right there, and I know what the deflection is right there, okay? And what are those deflections? Zero, right? In other words, here's the column, right? Here's the column. I can do better there. Here's the column before it's buckled. Here's the column after it's buckled, right? What's the deflection right here? I don't know. The deflection there might be three inches. The deflection right here might be two inches. What's the deflection right there? What's the deflection right here? Zero. Okay. So if I set up a coordinate system right here, this is at x equals zero, this right here is at x equals l, right? The length of the column, right? With me so far? So I have two boundary conditions that I can apply to here. Boundary condition one is that the deflection at x equals zero is zero. 
The boundary condition here is that the deflection at x equals L equals zero. <laughs> oh, now I'm not full. <laughs> you had a chance. You had a chance. Okay. In other words, we recognize that the lateral deflection at the top and the bottom of the column is in fact zero. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just plug and chug. Okay. So here is my expression for deflection. Now, just to be clear, remember our goal is actually to figure out what the load is. We want to figure out what P is. So we're taking a little bit of a roundabout way to get there. But I'm just treating this like a, 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 a Math 335 problem right now. Okay. So here's our expression for uh, the uh, deflection. Here's our boundary conditions. Let's apply the first boundary condition. So the first boundary condition says that y of 0 equals 0. Okay, so y of 0 equals c1 times the cosine of 0 plus c2 times the sine of 0. Now, what's the sine of 0? Zero? 0. What's the cosine of 0? 1, right? So 0 equals c1. So c1 is 0, right? So now I can take my deflection expression where it said yx equals c1 times this plus c2 times this. c1 is 0. So that makes this a lot easier. So that's where I actually get this term right here on the board. y of x equals c2 times the sine of alpha x. Now, what about the second boundary condition? The second boundary condition says plug in L and set everything equal to 0. And so I get this. Hmm. This one's a little bit trickier. Okay, this is a little bit trickier to interpret. Um, there are a variety of solutions that we could produce here. Okay, so let's let's take a look at this expression. Okay, and and specifically, I want to talk about the difference between what solutions are what we would call trivial and what solutions are non-trivial. Okay, so here's this expression. Now let's just ignore the physics of the problem. Let's ignore everything going on with what's happening in the real world, and let's just treat this like a math problem. What's one way that this could be true? Okay? Would you agree that one way that this equation right here could be true is if that's the case? Would that, would that make sense? That, math says that makes sense. But does physics say that makes sense? Okay? I propose no, because if C2 equals 0, what is my deflection? Zero. zero. And it's not zero, right? It's buckled, right? So I propose that this solution, while it makes sense mathematically, is trivial. That's trivial. Uh, that doesn't tell me anything, right? What about another one? What about L? Would this expre expression be true if L was 0? Well, hold on. If L is 0, what's, what's inside here? What's the sine of 0? 0, right? The sine of 0 is 0. So does, this, does the math work out if L equals 0? I say yes. But does that solution make sense physically? No, because this would mean the column has no length, right? Um, it's got a length, right? You see what I mean? This is a trivial solution. This doesn't make sense. What about alpha? Could alpha be zero and the expression hold true? Well, hold on. I'm, I'm going to do the math first. Does the math work out? Yes, but does the physics work out? What does alpha represent? Alpha is this, right? So if alpha is zero, that is saying that the column has no load on it, which that's not what's going on, right? We're applying load. We want to know what load causes it to buckle. So alpha equals zero is also trivial. So does anybody have an idea what a non-trivial solution would look like? Instead of C2 being 0, instead of L being 0, or alpha being 0, what's a non-trivial way of looking at this? 
Maybe a non-trivial way of looking at it is that. What about the, just the whole sine function? If the whole sine function is zero, that works. Okay? Maybe that solution isn't so trivial. Okay? Let's take a step back. If I graph the sine function, what does it look like? It's a wave, right? And this is what the graph of the sine function looks like. And in fact, the sine function only equals zero at integer multiples of pi, right? Okay? So I can say that if the sine of alpha L equals zero, then alpha L has to equal n times pi, where n is an integer. So I can solve for alpha, right? I can square alpha. I can set alpha squared equal to P over EI, and I can solve. And I get this, okay? And I propose that this term is an expression for the load that causes buckling, okay? Pi squared EI over L squared times this integer, okay? And this, this integer is just sort of sticking out there. And so some of you might be asking, well, what, what do we do with that? What is the integer, okay? The integer corresponds to what's called a mode shape, okay? So different values of N Will, pro uh, 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 will propagate different loads that will cause different types of buckling. In other words, that if I have a column and I want it to buckle like this, I need an end value of two, and this is the load that is required. If I want a column to buckle like this, that's an end value of three, and this is the load that causes that. But why? when I take the column in the real world and I put my hand on it, why does it only do the first one? Because the first one, looking at these integers, the first one yields the smallest load. Okay? In other words, if I take this column and I start pressing, 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 I hit this load well before I hit all of these. Okay? And so this would be a first mode buckling phenomenon. Okay? Um, and so that's going to be our worst case scenario. And so I propose that our buckling load is that. Okay? That's our buckling load. Okay? Pi squared EI over L squared. Okay? Now that is the elastic buckling load. We can also calculate an elastic buckling stress. Okay? The way that we compute the elastic buckling stress is we just divide this by the area. Okay, but we have sort of a way of rewriting that a little bit because we have a moment of inertia and we have an area. So if we divide I over A, that's the radius of gyration, that's R squared. So we can do a little bit of algebra and rework it a little bit and we, we can rework it in terms of L over R. Have we seen L over R before? That's slenderness, isn't it? So we can use a term that we've been familiar with before by using this term slenderness. So I propose that we can express the elastic buckling stress as pi squared E divided by the slenderness squared, L over R. Okay? So now we have a term for elastic buckling load and elastic buckling stress. Okay? Now, does this make sense? Okay. So we're done, right? That's the answer. That's how we calculate capacity of columns, right? No. Okay. There are a couple of problems with this derivation. This is an old derivation. This derivation comes back to the 1700s. I mean, this is an old derivation. Um, I propose that the terms I'm showing you are useful, but they're not good enough. Okay? And they're not good enough because they're not reflective of stuff that happens in the real world that this is missing. Okay? One of those is an effective length factor, which we, this we can get around with some pretty basic theory. Okay? What is the effective length factor? Um, well, here's the thing. When we did our derivation, we assumed a simply supported column. What if the column is not simply supported? What if the ends are fixed? What if the uh, one end is free? Okay, that changes the boundary conditions. Okay? So how do we handle that? 
Okay, the way that we handle that is through what are called effective link factors. So let me explain how an effective link factor works. So what we do is let's say we have a column that's fixed free. Okay, so if you have a column that's fixed and free, so it's, it's clamped on the bottom and it's free to move up top, it kind of buckles like this. Okay, so, so what we'll do is we'll say let's take that and sort of like sort of like shadow that out, extend that out. And so see how I'm sort of drawing that shape out, okay? If I go from an inflection point to inflection point, this distance is about twice that of this distance. See, this is what we did our derivation on, right? So we take a k value of one for the base case. For any other case, what we do is we take the buckled shape of the column and we say how far is it between the inflection points and take that distance and divide it by one over here and we get a k value. So for a fixed free column, we have a k value of two. Does that make sense? That idea makes sense? That's what an effective length factor is, okay? And you can look these up, okay? This is in the manual, okay? This is on 16.1-650. This is way back in the commentary. We're not gonna use these today, so it's not critical that we uh, bookmark this today, but we are gonna bookmark this later. But the only thing I'll say for the sake of discussion is that the manual lists both theoretical values and then actual recommended values for design. You definitely want to use the recommended values. So as an example, um, for fixed fixed columns, which is about the best case that you can get on boundary conditions, the theory says that your k value is 0.5. That's if I do the derivation, do the math, I get a k value of 1 half. But the spec says, no, 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 bump that up a little bit. Bump that up a little bit to a 0.65. The reason why is because a fixed boundary condition has infinite stiffness. It has zero rotation. And nothing in this world is perfectly stiff. Nothing in this world prevents absolutely any rotation, right? There's going to be a little bit of movement, a little bit of flexibility, okay? And so the spec says you need to have a little bit of cushion there. So you need to bump that up a little bit, okay? So that's why we use a K value of 0.65, okay? Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. So that one I can get around. I can get around boundary conditions pretty easily, okay? Um, here's the thing though. That derivation, I, so let's take effective length factors. We, we can handle that, okay? There's still a looming question is why can't I use that derivation I just generated? Why can't I use it? There are two big reasons. Specifically, there are two big reasons why real column behavior deviates from ideal column behavior. Everything that I've done up until now in that derivation is idealized, right? A perfectly elastic column that's perfectly straight, that has pin-pin boundary conditions. That's a perfect world column. That's not how it is in the real world, okay? In the real world, column behavior deviates from that for two really big reasons, okay? The first reason is what are called residual stresses, okay? So let me explain what a residual stress is, okay? So how do we manufacture like a W shape? How do we do that, okay? Well, we get a big old molten, you know, uh, pot of steel, roll that into a billet near net shape, right? pass it through a series of successive rollers that squish it down into the cross section that you see here, right? Then what happens? It cools down, right? But the thing is, it does not cool down at the same rate, okay? Remember, when metal cools down, it contracts. When it heats up, it expands, right? But the different cross, -sec the different cross sectional elements are cooling at different rates. See, what's happening in a shape like this, in a shape like an eye shape, is that the flange tips, they're cooling first, right? Then maybe the center of the web, but this part here, this part where the flange and the web meet, they're cooling last, okay? So what's happening is you've got some sections that are kind of wanting to shrink, and you've got other sections of the cross section that aren't wanting to let that happen, right? So you've got this internal battle within the section as it cools down. It's almost like what happens is as it cools down, it's like, and then there are these stresses that are just sort of locked in, okay? And those are called residual stresses. They come from the uneven cooling uh, that happens when the section uh, uh, finishes the rolling process. And what tends to happen is the, um, the tips 
right here, this tip right here, this tip right here, uh, so the, the flange tips in the center of the web, they go into compression, okay? And then what happens is the center, or this flange web junction here and here, they go into tension, right? The compression has to equal the tension. So the sum total of the stresses in the section are zero. Otherwise, the columns run away from you because it, it's got a, a net force on it. So it has to reach equilibrium, okay? But I propose there are stresses locked in already, okay? Now, as you apply compressive load, these outstretched sections here, they're going to yield before the rest of the section does. Now, some of you are asking, well, wait, Dr. Mike, why don't you talk about this with tension members? Are, are these present in tension members? Yes, they are, okay? But the difference between a tension member and a compression member is a compression member or a tension member does not present a stability problem. Tension members don't buckle, okay? This is a little bit of a different issue with a compression member, okay? So what happens is, and by the way, I mean, you can get residual stresses from cold bending, from cambering, from welding. You can get it from a couple of other different sources. See, what happens is, like, here would be an idealized stress strain curve. Like, the material behaves like a rubber band until it hits yielding, and then it, you know, yields. But that's not what's really happening with a column. What's happening is that yielding phenomenon is much more gradual. Because as you apply that compressive load, you're getting yielding that's penetrating throughout the section. Okay? Does that make sense? So the capacity is going gonna, is gonna to reduce a little bit more um, precipitously than it would you know, if we didn't have to consider residual stresses. Does, does that make sense? Okay, so this is sort of the first big problem with compression members, why real behavior deviates from ideal behavior, and that first problem is residual stresses. Okay, that's the first problem. The second problem is imperfections, okay? I told you that in my derivation, I was assuming that this column was perfectly straight. There is no column that is perfectly straight, none. There is no column that is perfectly straight. There is no column that is perfectly plumb, okay? And so what I mean by that, an out of straightness would be the column having a little bit of a bow to it, okay? Now, I mean, I'm really pronouncing this bow. I mean, like real world bow is, I mean, we're talking about the order of L over a thousand. It's not much but it's there, okay? That's out of straightness. Out of plumbness is if the column is sort of tilted over a little bit. Now the spec has, you know, some pretty tight restrictions on that. I mean, like H over 500 is typically, you know, an out of plumbness restriction. And H over 500, you do the math, that's like a quarter inches in like 12 feet. Now that's not much, that's really little, okay? But um, that can have a very significant effect on compressive capacity. Let me sort of like make the point with a somewhat visceral example, okay? So let's say that I'm standing on top of a hill, okay? I'm standing on top of a hill, and Mr. Newman comes in. He doesn't like me very much. So Mr. Newman comes in, and he gives me a shove, okay? So what happens is I'm standing on top of a hill, and he gives me a shove. I can probably like catch myself, okay? But now imagine the same scenario, but with me wearing an 80 pound backpack, okay? That's different, okay? Because would you agree it's gonna be harder for me to maintain my equilibrium with that weight? Would you agree with that? But why? Like, what's the physics reason why, okay? Let me give you a physics example, or physics explanation. So I'm standing like this, okay, I've got the backpack on. I've got the backpack lined up with my center of gravity, okay? So Mr. Newman comes and gives me a show. Okay, so what happens is I go like this. Okay, so what happens? The backpack goes off my center of gravity, right? Okay, so what does that do? That causes a moment. Okay, what does that moment do? It causes more deflection. What does that deflection yield? More moment, more moment, more deflection. You see what I mean? And it sort of builds on itself, right? So you get that whoa, 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 you know, type, type effect going on. Does, does that make sense? We call that a second order effect. That's what a second order effect is. When the displaced shape affects the equilibrium, okay? Where the equilibrium changes after displacement, okay? We did not consider that in structural analysis last semester. Everything that we did last semester was a first order deflection problem. In other words, we put the load on, the structure deformed, and that was it, 
Okay? But whenever you have stability problems, it is possible that you have a second order effect going on. That after displacement, you need to recheck equilibrium. That equilibrium might cause more moment or more axial load, which causes more displacement. Okay? And that can happen in columns. Okay? Now, we have a really simple way of handling that with uh, capacity checks, but it is, a, um, uh, it is a, a process that you need to consider. Okay? So in an ideal column, so, so the math for an ideal column says, this is what the math says for an ideal column. The math says that if you have a perfectly straight column, what's going to happen is you're going to apply load, apply load, apply load, apply load, sudden infinite lateral displacement, right? In math terms, we call that a bifurcation, right? It's either buckled or it's not, okay? That's not really what's happening in the real world. If you have a little bit of an additional, uh, uh, or a, a, a little imperfection, what's happening is as you apply the load, I mean, you can even see this column kind of has a little bit of an imperfection. As you apply the load, the deflection is much more gradual, much more sudden. But as a result, the column is typically a bit weaker. Okay, does that make sense? So the two reasons why real column behavior deviates from ideal column behavior are the presence of residual stresses and the presence of geometric imperfections. There is no way I would ever ask that on an exam or anything. So, my goodness. I'm not throwing any more hints in you, I'm just saying. Okay. All right, everybody with me so far? Okay, so how do we account for that? Okay, we account for that with the spec. Okay, the spec takes, so, so let me explain how the specification works. Okay, so the way the specification works is the specification utilizes the elastic buckling stress or the Euler buckling stress. I use the term Euler because Leonard Euler derived that derivation back in the 1700s. We use the elastic buckling stress as a term for our capacity, but it is not the actual capacity. Okay. Specifically, a couple things worth mentioning. So first off, just phi is 0.9. Let's just get that out of the way. Phi is 0.9. Um, what we do is we compute an a slenderness, but more specifically, an effective slenderness. So instead of the slenderness being L over R, our slenderness is going to be KL over R. Okay. Now what we're going to do is take the slenderness and ask ourselves whether or not we're in elastic buckling territory or inelastic buckling territory. And basically what's, what the spec is saying is that if you have a column that's really, really slender, I mean we're talking toothpick slender, then there's not as much ability for the column to develop yielding level stresses. So the column's going to behave elastically. And so the capacity in this elastic range is going to be what we calculate from the theory reduced a little bit, reduced by 87.7%. Where, why are we reducing it? Like this is the theoretical buckling. So this, this dashed line is what we get from the theory, from what we derive. And then this is reduced a little bit. Why are we reducing it a little bit in the elastic range? Because of those imperfections, okay? The imperfections have much more of a pronounced impact in the elastic range than I would say they do in the inelastic range. Now this is the inelastic buckling capacity. How are we getting from here to here? What, what's happening here? Well, beyond the inelastic behavior, it's the presence of those residual stresses. So those residual stresses are going to have more of a pronounced impact when we're talking about the column yielding and whatnot. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, so basically what we do is we compute a slenderness. This term LC is just KL, so we take a KL over R. We take a KL over R and we compare it against this term right here. What is this term, this 4.71 square root of E over FY? That's just when take this equation, set it equal to this equation, solve for the slenderness. So this is just the point at which these two equations equal to one another. So we compute a slenderness and we say, okay, if the slenderness is less than this term, the column's gonna buckle inelastically. If it's greater than this term, it's gonna buckle elastically. This is the expression for inelastic, or for elastic capacity. This is the expression for inelastic capacity. Okay, um, the equations for that are right here. So if you want to determine this stress, the way that this stress works is the first thing that you have to do is you have to compute your elastic stress. The elastic stress is the Young's, so we take pi squared E divided by KL over R squared. Um, e is the Young's modulus for steel. For every grade of steel, Young's modulus is 29,000 KSI. You can set your watch by that. 
Um, KL over R is the slenderness. This isn't going to matter for this homework assignment, but for next week and to come, make sure you're careful with your slenderness. Column lengths are in feet. Radii of gyration are in inches. Okay. Now, the next thing you do after you get your FE is you compute your FN. Okay. And the idea is that if KL over R is less than or equal to all of this, then that's your capacity or your, your stress. If KL over R is greater than this, this is your stress. Now, the one thing I want to be clear about, because this is the first time seeing an equation like this, this right here, where it says 0.658, and then it says Fy over Fe, that is an exponent, okay? So it's 0 0.658 raised to the Fy over Fe. That, that fraction is an exponent. It's not multiplied by that fraction, okay? So it would be like 0 0.658 raised to the Fy over Fe. Do, do, do you get what I'm saying? Okay. Everybody with me so far? Okay. How many of you have ever heard of Desmos? You heard Desmos? Okay. So I, uh, I had some fun with this. I put a link on Blackboard to this, but um, this is a plot I made in Desmos. This shows the... AISC column capacity as a function of the yield stress, right? So what you can do is you can drag this over and then as the yield stress changes, you can see the red curve is what you get from the, the spec. That's what you get from the steel manual. This is the AISC column capacity. The blue curve is just the theory. So the blue curve is just, so all the blue curve is is pi squared E divided by KL over R squared, right? Pi squared E divided by KL over R squared. And all I'm doing right here is I'm just cutting it off at FY. That, that's all I'm doing there. So you can even just animate it if you want. I don't know. I just think that's kind of cool. Any questions on that? Okay. So if you don't have any questions on that, I do want to explain your homework because you have a homework using my favorite software program, Excel. So I want you to produce a spreadsheet that will plot the critical buckling stress for a column if the yield stress is 36 KSI. Okay. So the way that it should work is K, um, KL over R is on the x-axis and FN is on the y-axis. So treat KL over R like it's x. Okay treat Fn as if it's y. Okay, I want you to plot from a KL over R of zero to a KL over R of 200 in increments of five. Okay, and make sure, you know, it's Excel, so make sure you label your axes and your titles and whatnot uh, appropriately. Um, and so that you are aware, the reason I'm having you do this is so you get familiar with the equation, because these equations are a little different than what you've been doing so far. Okay. So I'll give you some hints down here below. So some hints for simplicity. I think you should have three columns in your cell sheet, one for KL over R, one for FE, and one for FN. Like do a separate calculation for FE. Just trust me on that. Um, Y'all know how to do it pi in Excel, right? So you do equals pi like that. Just no, nothing inside. Okay. Um, okay. Um, at zero... So if you do the math, at zero, Fe is going to be like infinite, okay? Because Fe, see, if you do pi squared E divided by KL over R squared, and you treat the KL over R like an X, then it's like Y equals C over X squared. And that's a hyperbola, and it goes up to infinity there at zero. But Fn is going to be 36, so it's not going to matter, okay? Don't incorporate a fee value. I just don't, don't worry about fee, okay? I just want the expression for Fn. Um, the only other thing I mentioned is that the if formula might help out. Like if KL over R is less than or equal to this, then here's your formula. Otherwise, here's your formula. So you can use that. And done correctly, what it should look like is that. Or more specifically, it should look like this. This is what it should look like. Okay. That's what it should look like when it's all said and done. Okay. Let me take a step back and see what everybody thinks. 
I'm hoping that this is like a 10 minute assignment, you know? And honestly, I hope you're spending more time formatting the chart than you are actually doing the math. I want the math to be pretty easy. I just want to force you to see some of these equations, okay? And by the way, this cr uh, graph, I have it um, on uh, Blackboard. There's a link to it, so you can pull it up and mess around with it as much as you want. Okay, I'm going to take a step back see if anybody has any questions. I'm going to give you five minutes of your life back. Sound good? I will see you. Y'all have a good weekend.